All right, well, thanks very much. Um, as you, uh, Dr. Kennedy said, uh, we're going to continue the lecture that we started a couple of weeks ago. Um, some obligatory slides initially. I have no disclosures. Um, and the objectives, as we, as we outlined before, review the normal appearance of the brain, re review some common intracranial pathology, and we're going to discuss case scenarios. Today, we're going to concentrate mostly on the case scenarios. Um, what I thought I might do is, since it's been a, a month or two now since we did number one, I thought I'd briefly review um, some of the, the, uh, the, the basics, if you will, to remind you of, of, of what we talked about previously before we go on to talk about individual cases. You know that on MR we perform a series of different pulse sequences to characterize uh, an underlying abnormality. Um, usually in, in neonates, it's a combination of T1 and T2 weighted imaging. Um, Recognize that there's uh, in T1. There's not too many things that are that are bright on T1, so it's a pretty easy list to remember. Fat is bright on T1, as, as you can see in the subcutaneous region. Proteinaceous fluid, some calcium. If you have subacute blood, um, it will also be bright. Obviously, if you give gadolinium, and importantly for um, for this uh, this audience, mature white matter is hyper intense. Immature white matter is hypo intense on T1. Most, conversely, most pathology on T1 is hypo-intense. The increased uh, fluid content of the tissue causes the hypo-intensity. So fluid collections, edema, and most neoplasms are hypo-intense. CSF is hypo-intense, as you can see in the superior cerebellar cistern, prepontine cistern. Um, and uh, cortical bone has, has no mobile proton, so it's hypo-intense. Rapid flow can be hypo-intense, like you see in the basal or trunk or the straight sinus. Just like not too much is bright on T1, not too much is dark on T2. There are a few things, chronic blood, iron deposition, dense cellularity, some proteinaceous fluid collections. And again, importantly for this audience, again, mature white matter is hypo-intense, whereas immature white matter is hyper-intense. Why? Because there's a very high water content of the tissue in, that imma in the immature white matter. Not, and the uh, myelin is not yet developed. So it's a combination of those two findings. Um, most uh, pathology on T2 is hyperintense. Again, increased fluid contents so of fluid, edema, gliosis, most neoplasms, subacute blood. It can also be, it will also be hyperintense on, on uh, T2. And CSF, as you, as you can see here, is hyperintense on T2. Flare really doesn't play much of a role in your in the kids that you're looking at because the it's it's a confusing pulse sequence. You know we rely on T1 and T2 to figure out what's mature and immature white matter and flare is a kind of is a combination of the two. So anything that's uh, uh, has a short T1 or a long T2 is bright, so it can be very confusing. So we basically have avoided it altogether up until about the age of two and a half. Uh, Contrast basics, why do we use T1 uh, images? We look to identify and characterize anatomy, to localize the anatomy, localize eloquent cortex, assess mass effect, look for enhancement if we've given gadolinium. We can look for marrow infiltrative processes, particularly in the older kids, and you're, in the kids that you're, you're really looking at, not so much of a, not too much of a benefit. Why? Because we rely on fatty, pathologic marrow to contrast against fatty marrow and most of the, the neonates have you know predominantly red marrow so hence the, that inherent contrast doesn't exist uh, in the in the neonates and in the preemies. Um, on T, T2 we largely use it for sensitivity to disease so most diseases as we said before are, are hyper intense on T2 so strokes, most neoplasm, gliosis, demyelination will all be bright on T2 weighted images. We routinely use it in spine imaging for extradural disease, intramedullary disease. Um, again, we can use it for marrow uh, we look, and uh, for uh, blood byproducts. The gradient echo images are far more sensitive to blood byproducts. We now have a, another pulse sequence you'll see, ex examples of which you'll see shortly which is called susceptibility weighted imaging. So it's far more sensitive and higher spatial resolution to, to detect blood byproducts or to detect calcium or, or air. Anything that causes a local field in homogeneity will be, will be more obvious on the gradient echo acquisition. 
Um, Remember why we use gadolinium if you're thinking inflammatory, an acute inflammatory process, leptomeningeal disease, primary or secondary neoplasms, uh, demyelinating disease, um, intradural extramedullary disease, or intramedullary disease in, in, the, in the spine. Those would all, uh, are, are all things that we use typically for, um, for uh, want to give contrast in, the, in those uh, scenarios. Where is it unnecessary? If you're just look, if you're looking to rule out stroke, um, most cases of epilepsy don't need contrast. Certainly trauma doesn't necessarily need contrast. If you're looking for a developmental abnormality, it doesn't typically need contrast. Um, so I ask you to, to uh, use, it, use it judiciously, particularly in view of the, you know, what's going on in the lay press with regard to gadolinium deposition. Everybody's concerned about that. Young adults, mom and dad, um, you know, what's this going to do? Um, to remind you, we really don't have enough information to tell you. We know it's getting deposited, but we, to, realistically, we don't know that it's causing harm to the tissue. Uh, but we do can say that it is, that it is getting deposited in, in tissues, both in the brain and outside of the brain, albeit in nominal amounts. Um, the challenges in, in, in imaging kids, uh, as you know, they're not necessarily sedated. Oftentimes, we just feed them and bundle them and, and uh, hope they don't move while we're, while we're imaging them. Uh, they're relatively small, so it demands high signal to noise. We have to apply vari variable pulse sequences. And remember, it's a moving target because the myelin is always changing during, you know, in this period of time. So you have to remember what the normal is versus you know, for that given chronologic age to figure out what the abnormality is. And we'll, we'll brief, briefly review that again. Remember that the myelination process takes place from birth up into about two years, or a little, actually a little bit beyond that. Um, cortical organization takes place generally about uh, 22 weeks up, up until, again, two plus years. Uh, but realistically, this plus is, is uh, it goes, that myelination actually goes up into the second decade, realistically. But uh, for the most, from an imaging standpoint, it's about two, two and a half years. So this is, the, this is what we see. You know, and so in your kids, if you expect a full-term child, the T2s are going to look like this. The T1s are going to look like this. So this is kind of the, the, the true contrast. So gray matter is gray. White matter is white on the T2-lettered images. Um, in contrast to the mature child, the older child, the, the adult, where we expect the more normal uh, contrast between gray and white matter, both on T2 and the T1-lettered images. Remember that, uh, just to briefly review some easy myelination milestones. Um, remember, that, as we said, the contrast is inverted at birth in contrast to what we see. And in general, the, t the maturation on T1 precedes the maturation on T2 for any given structure. If you're, if you're just going by trends in maturation, which actually pretty, can be pretty helpful, the myelination progresses from central to peripheral, from caudal to cephalad, and from dorsal to ventral. The T1 tends to mature by about 12 months of age, whereas the T2-weighted images tend to mature about 24 months of age. More specifically, in, on T1, the deep white matter is, is largely mature on T1 by six months of age, and then there's a progressive wave from dorsal to ventral from the six months to the 12 months of age, such that their brains mature by 12 months. On T2, that deep white matter is mature by about nine to 12 months. And then there's this progressive wave again from dorsal to ventral, um, such that it completely mature by about 24 months of age. Remember the subcortical white matter is the last to mature and within the subcortical white matter, the frontal and temporal pole is the last to mature. So this is the, the appearance of a full-term child at birth. The, the, the only myelin that's relatively mature is that which is hyperintense. So a small portion of the uh, corticospinal tracts, the, the, a portion of the uh, thalamus, the uh, dorsal aspect of the globus pallidus, the ascending, some of the ascending tracts in the dorsal brainstem. Um, and then you begin to see a little bit projecting up towards the pre- and post-central gyla, but really it's, for all intents and purposes, it stops about the corona radiata on T1. Likewise on T2, same pattern, but in this case, the mature white matter is dark. Again, corticospinal tracts, thalamus, 
Robit and the Globus Pallidus, dorsal uh, ascending tracks in the in the um, in the um, in the brainstem. This is the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles here in the midbrain. So just some sensory tracks basically are are are, are some are mature on T1 and T2. <clears throat> kind of a global picture with some easy milestones to remember perhaps. On T1, internal capsule is entirely myelinated by three months, optic radiation is by one month. Whereas we saw a little glimmer of myelination in the corona radiata on, the, on that newborn, now we see it's more complete in the corona radiata, and now you can clearly identify the pre and post central gyri. Why? Because there's hyper intense, more mature white matter there. The corpus callosum matures at, uh, dorsally at four months, anteriorly at six months. This child's five months of age, so the dorsal aspect looks mature, the anterior aspect looks immature. The deep white matter, as we said, is mature by six months of age. Now we get this progressive wave of subcortical uh, myelination from dorsal to ventral. So the only thing that's arborized in the subcortical white matter is the primary visual cortex, the pre and post central gyri, everything else looks immature. By 12 months, we're back to where we've reached a mature state. On T2, Remember on, the, on T1, the internal capsule is myelinated at three months. On T2, it's myelinated at least initially by at seven months, and then it undergoes progressive thickening from seven months to 11 months of age. We said that the corpus callosum on T1 matures at four months and six months. On T2, it's six months and eight months. So these are both hypo-intense, so this child is about eight months of age. Um, by 10 months of age, you start to see the, cort the subcortical white matter gets, um, sorry, um, nearly iso-intense to the overlying cortex, so that you can't really see the gray-white delineation anymore. That's an easy landmark for 10 months, and then by 12 months, we're, we're back to our mature state. Remember that not only myelination is taking place, but cortical organization is taking place at birth. The sulci are rather broad, shallow, and, and simple in nature, i.e. in a primary sulci. Over time, they become increasingly deep, increasingly complex. We see the normal complex infolding when the child is mature, when that, that cortical organization process has, has, com has complete. So with that brief kind of you know, overview, we're going to go through some case presentations. Dr. Kennedy sent me, sent me a, a, a several case presentations, and uh, I included some myself. So I've copied the histories that Dr. Kennedy included. So this is a child who's former 36-week uh, preemie, seven days uh, of age, born by C-section, APGARS 1, 2, and 7, meconium stain fluid, subclinical seizures, underwent cooling, had some hypoglycemia. The seizures were treated with phenobarb. So what are the findings? Let's go back to our basics. Okay, so uh, if you take a look at the T1s, everything looks hypo-intense. Looks like, a, looks like a, a, a newborn, right? Full-term newborn. The white matter is very hyper-intense, i.e., you know, high water content. We see a nice gray-white delineation because of that high water content, so it looks like a, like a newborn, right? And uh, the pituitary gland is hyper-intense. It's supposed to be hyper-intense and for the first couple months of age, normal. Okay, but what's abnormal? This bright thing sitting in the fourth ventricle is not supposed to be there. This stuff down along the floor of the posterior fossa is not supposed to be there. So this, remember there's not too many things that are bright on T1, but blood, it's not, certainly not fat, um, but blood would be hyperintense. So this is a little intraventricular and subarachnoid blood. Here's the coronal gradient echo acquisition, so T1-like, okay? We see more blood within the ventricle. It's probably in variable age because this central component is hypointense. So this looks like he bled a couple di on a couple different time points, right? Uh, this being a little bit older, this being a little bit younger. Remember we also we said not too many things are hypo-intense on T2, so we know this is blood. This fits with, this fits with blood too. So this T2 hypo-intensity within the ventricles is all relatively acute blood. So we're probably on the transition between acute and early subacute because this is probably uh, intracellular met hemoglobin. This is probably deoxyhemoglobin. So we're right at that transition stage. Um, 
if you look on the T2 weighted image, you see that it's intraventricular. But there's also some parenchymal components. Remember we said that the gradient echo acquisition makes the blood a little bit more obvious because of the, because of the, uh, the iron content of the blood. So these are those gradient echo images. They're not terribly pretty because the child was moving at that, okay? <laughs> but you get the point. Intraventricular blood, very obvious, strikingly hypointense. But we can also see some blood within the parenchyma. We also see these radiating bands. These are, these are medullary veins with deoxyhemoglobin. That's why they stand out. So maybe some of this blood is actually uh, represents some thrombosed medullary veins extending in, 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 and or, you know, and into the adjacent parenchyma. So you can all kind of put everything together here. Let's look back at the diffusion study carefully. Remember the diffusion study gives us acute cytotoxic edema. What do we want to see? We want to see hyperintensity on the diffusion trace images corresponding hypointensity on the ADC maps. Okay, so let's look at this. Here's the intraventricular blood. It's causing some dephasing signal loss. But look at the spunium of the corpus callosum. It's hyperintense. Well, that's white matter. Why doesn't it look like the white matter in the frontal poles? Because and we, let's, let's look at it a little bit further. So that's hyperintense. Looks like it's acute cytotoxic edema. Look at the ADC maps. It's hypointense. That's white matter, too. It should look like the frontal poles. It doesn't. So that's some, some acute uh, cytotoxic edema within that corpus callosum, in addition to all the other findings that we saw, that we see, some intraventricular blood, subarachnoid blood, parenchymal blood. Um, so it's a combination of all, the, all those findings in this child. Here's another child, four-month-old, former 24-weeker. Uh, mother, mother and child both had E. coli sepsis. Um, head ultrasound demonstrated grade 3 to four IVH on day two. Um, day one head ultrasound was normal. Um, child is currently seizing and, and a shunt has been placed. So here's our little shunt tube. Let's figure out what else we can see. So remember that, the, so this is a 24 weaker. We would think that the cortical organization probably a little bit less uh, mature. This is the T1, this is the T2. We don't have too much to go by because the ventricles are so big. But we can say that the white matter looks like it's supposed to in a, in a, in a neonate on T2 and T1. But the morphology doesn't look right at all, does it? Okay, so there's some bright stuff uh, sitting uh, uh, where the third lateral ventricle should be. So he's got some intraventricular blood on the T1, scattered foci elsewhere. But look at the size of the, those lateral ventricles. Here you can better appreciate it. Look at the size of those lateral ventricles. <clears throat> Looks like he's got, um, so they're not only distended, um, temporal horns are prominently enlarged. Remember Pousset's law, the pressure is going to be distributed uniformly across a, a given cavity. So the fact that the temporal horns are big, the corpus callosum is bowed superiorly, would suggest that he's got some hydrocephalus. Um, now the question is, why does he have hydrocephalus? Is it meningitis, so sacralia meningitis, or is it sacralia prior, uh, prior intraventricular hemorrhage? Well, here's our friend, the SWI acquisition. Look at all the hemocytorin and ferritin deposition along the margins of the ependymal surfaces. So this is all indicative of prior, the prior intraventricular hemorrhage. Moreover, you can, appear, you can appreciate some septations within the ventricles. Here's our distended temporal horns, but those the, the blood byproducts the, the, and the septations are causing some obstructive hydrocephalus. We could also see some evidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage along the peel surface of the brainstem. <coughs> Remember we showed you some, the KISS sequence, which is that, that cisternogram effectively. So these are cistern, those, the KISS sequence that I reconstructed in the sagittal and coronal planes. So here's what we can appreciate the big, the prominent upward bowing of the corpus callosum because it's getting stretched because the CSF can't get out. Um, here we see some of our loculations. There's another loculation in the superior cerebellar cistern. That's not supposed to be there, right? So it's all reflective. It's all probably some scarring in the basilar cisterns from all that subarachnoid hemorrhage. But look beyond that. Look what's going on in the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is markedly distended. The, the brain stem looks like it's flattened in contrast to what it should be. Um, perhaps some underlying volume loss as well, but certainly that fourth ventricle doesn't look at all normal. So with the, not only is the, um, if we look, uh, I 
take a step back. If we look a little bit cephalo, you can see this is the tectum. We don't see a good uh, uh, cerebral aqueduct. So he's, he's obstructed the outlet of the third ventricle. He's also got a trapped fourth ventricle. Remember the choroid plexus is producing CSF in the fourth ventricle. It's the same scarring that caused an obstruction in, in, up here that's partially solved by, this, by the shunt tube. Looks like it needs another shunt tube down below because the fourth ventricle is trapped. Okay, here's a uh, former 37-week preemie. APGAR scores of 6 and 8, developed seizures on day 5, had underlying coagulopathy and cardiac dysfunction. What do we see here? Well, it looks far more normal than the last case, right? Again, uh, white matter looks about, about right on T2 and, and T1 globally. So it looks like a, like a, a, um, a near-term infant. But there are some bright spots on the T1 that aren't supposed to be there, right? Again, is it blood? Is it all dystrophic calcification? Here's the SWI, susceptibility artifact. Looks like it's blood. Not nearly as apparent on the T2 iterated images, but that's that, T, that little spotty T2 hypo intensity. If you look on the corresponding diffusion study, you can see that there's some cytotoxic edema in the adjacent white matter. Be careful with this because blood can also look can also give you restricted diffusion. But this look goes a little bit beyond those little spots of blood, so he probably has a little, a little ischemia, a little white matter adjacent to it. Um, well, let's take a, take, so we think he's got some little white matter ischemia. We think he's got some, some blood within the parenchyma. Is that all he's got? Look a little bit more closely. Well, there's something sitting in that inferior temporal gyrus on the right. Looks like this, doesn't it? Here's the T1, so it's hyper intense on T1. There it is again. So this is parenchymal blood sitting in that inferior temporal gyrus, hypo intense on the on the SWI. So now we have to try and figure out why does this child have parenchymal blood in, in a couple different locations and some acute, some acute white matter ischemia. This is the MRV. I didn't bring you the, the reconstructed images, which everybody likes to look at. Why? Because this the, these are the images I want you to look at. I don't want you to look at the other ones. <laughs> look at the individual slices because they're far more informative that you start to lose some information in those reconstructions. So I'm showing you both transverse sinuses. This is the right or the, uh, this is the left. Um, you see a filling defect sitting within, the within, that, within each transverse sinus. So this is partially including thrombus, probably causing venous hypertension secondary venous infarct, which explains the ischemia and the, and the hemorrhage, right? Because venous infarcts are classically hemorrhagic. So it all, see, all fits in a nice, neat package. Um, what you should see here is uniform hyperintensity from the flow of the enhancement in that, in that uh, MRV. Instead, you see, so this, looks, this is normal in the sigmoid sinus. That's abnormal. You shouldn't see a filling defect sitting there. That's too perfect. And if, and the follow-up study, um, that filling defect is gone. The sinus is actually, the you know, that, that transverse sinus is actually a little bit smaller. Um, so there's probably a little bit of clot along the periphery, but, but uh, that central clot is, was dissipating on the follow-up study. Here's a former 30-week 30, 30 preemie. Um, APGAR scores are 7 and 8. He had uh, RDS, was treated with uh, time of birth, um, PFO, ASD, episodic uh, apneas, uh, bradycardias, developed PVL at uh, six weeks of age following necrotizing enterocolitis. So let's take a look at these images. I've already told you he's got PVL, or Dr. Kanadi's already told you he's got PVL. <laughs> and, uh, but what do we see on these images? So here's the parasagittal T1s. Um, we see this striking hypo-intensity with some peripheral hyper-intensity on the, on the T1-weighted images. So is that, are those cystic changes, is that encephalomalacia? What's that T1 hyper-intensity? Well, it's probably not blood, because we know that he had PVL, right? Doesn't make any sense. And we know that this was you know, some time ago. So this is probably just a little bit, remember one of the things that can be bright on T1 is a little dystrophic calcification. 
So that's probably what this is, a little bit of dystrophic calcification or maybe some laminar necrosis because it butts right up against the cortex, doesn't it? Um, in any event, let's, look, let's characterize these white matter lesions a little bit better. On the coronal images, they look more well-defined, periventricular in location. Um, here's the SWI included just to show you that, that, those, that this is not blood because it always sees a, little, a single little dot there, so it's not, not, not showing up. Um, on the T2 weighted images, you can appreciate, again, striking a hy hyperintensity in that white matter, far more hyperintense than we saw, uh, than we saw on, the, on the normal kids. So this is undergoing cystic change, that cystic degeneration, that white matter, and eventually the, the, those cystic changes will get incorporated into the ventricles. So the ventricles will be big, CSF space over the convexity will be relatively small. Um, just here's a cautionary note. So I pulled up, uh, this is the diffusion image. Here's the diffusion weighted image. Here's the ADC maps. So if, if I were to look at this, and I thought, and I knew that the white matter looked pretty normal on the, on the brain, I'd say that contrast between gray and white matter is too good. I mean, is there, is there, was there a global anoxic event? Well, uh, you're, you're getting misled here. And that, because if you take a look down below, it looks far more normal, doesn't it? Down at the level of the basal ganglia. And not, moreover, the, basal, you know, the deep gray matter structures look normal, which would be really odd for a global event, right? So the reason for this striking discrepant contrast between gray and white matter is because there's no white matter there, right? I mean, all the white matter is undergoing cystic degeneration. So, but if, if you saw this otherwise in a, in a, in a, in a child, think, you know, some global, uh, global event. Another um, example of a child with PVL later on in the stage, what do we see? Sagittal T1 and, T and axial T2s look a little bit more mature, right? Um, subcortical white matter looks nearly iso-intense, so maybe he's about 10 months of age based on the T2 weighted images. On the T1 weighted images, it's uh, kind of difficult to tell. We don't have too much white matter to go by. But at least, let's say, I don't know, it's not too much to go by. Maybe three to four months at least, but, so it's discordant. Um, actually, this is a little bit more hyperintense, so maybe six months thereabouts. Difficult to know. In any event, morphologically, what do we see? We see those same cystic changes, but look at the ventricles. This is the kind of the classic appearance of PVL. In large ventricles, small CSF space over the convexities, undulating appearance of, of the contour of, that, of those ventricles. And in this case, there's so much central white matter volume loss that the ependymal surface nearly abuts the overlying cortex. There's no white matter remaining in, in, in any of these sequences. Here's the sylvian fissure butting right up against the ependymal surface, for example. So this child did have, this is the study at 12 months. This is three months of age. So at three months, you can see a little bit of intraventricular blood, the most f uh, prominent of which is sitting in the region of the caudothalamic groove. A germinal matrix hemorrhage. At 12 months of age, all we see is this little bit of, of uh, uh, blood in the caudothalamic groove, so a little residual of that uh, interventricular hemorrhage. So if we know that this child is 12 months of age, that means the myelination is, is delayed for the child's chronologic age. Why? That subcortical white matter should be um, a bit better, right? Well, it should be more iso-intense, and it's still hyper-intense. Okay, here's a 40-week child um, born C-section after failed vacuum. Apgar is in six and seven. Um, birth weight was eight pounds. Uh, concern for acute respiratory distress, slow feeding, and seizure-like activities. Okay, let's address the latter thing. Why, why are the seizures going on? Again, we got some T1 hyperintensity, but this case it follows the contour of the, of the brain in a smooth fashion. So this is some subdural hemorrhage. It goes into the sulcus, so that's some subarachnoid blood. Goes into the parenchyma, so we've got some parenchymal blood on the T1 weighted images. Ventricles don't look big. Here's our SWI acquisitions. What do we see? Look at all this 
hypo intensity following the contour of the sulci. So that fits with the subarachnoid blood. Here's a little hypo intensity within the parenchyma, parenchymal hemorrhage. Here's our subdural hemorrhage along the periphery. Remember, here's our subdural hemorrhage. Here's our subdural hemorrhage causing the hypo intensity on the SWI. Remember, this child was, was suctioned, so here's his subgaleal fluid collection or cephalohematoma. What's going on in the underlying parenchyma? So we know that he's got some parenchymal hemorrhages. We know that he's got some subarachnoid blood. Look at the adjacent parenchyma. Is there some acute cytotoxic edema, hyperintense on, S on diffusion weighted, hypointense on the ADC maps, small amount of adjacent hemorrhage. So it looks like there are multiple little contusions, if you will, in this case, rather than infarcts, probably from the, from the mechanical uh, um, damage from the, from the suction. So it sits right at the vertex. So all, everything seems to, to make sense when you put it all pieces, parts together. Okay, so my history is gonna be far shorter, okay. <laughs> um, this is a child uh, with grade, an example of grade one IVH. Um, the ventricles look relatively normal in size and configuration for a child. This is gestational age, uh, 35 weeks, former 27 week preemie, born cyanotic with uh, reduced uh, heart rate, APGAR 001 and 3. Um, in any event, so the cortical organization looks about right. White gray matter and white matter looks about right, but we see these hypo intense things along the ependymal surface. More obvious on the gradient echo acquisition, so these are the little germinal matrix hemorrhages uh, without intraventricular. Without, uh, uh, intraventricular extension, okay, and without uh, ventricular dilatation, obviously. So, um, is it uh, just fits with a grade one IVH, right? All makes sense. Um, this is just my note to remind you to look for myelination and look at the look at the sulcation. Don't stop at the blood. Here's a grade three IVH. So, as we saw before, this is not that dissimilar from the earlier case. Ventricles are prominently distended. Look at the look at those lateral third and uh, lateral and third ventricles. Balloon. Look at the size of those temporal horns. They look too big too, don't they? Um, if you look on the on the T2 weighted images. You get a little hint of the blood byproducts, but far more obvious on the SWI lining the pentamal surface. Some septations within the ventricles, displaced choroid plexus. We see some evidence of subarachnoid blood along the margins of each. Freeman of Lushka along the peel surface of the caudal brain stem. Here's our old friend, the KISS sequence that I reconstructed. So in contrast to our, our child before, this aqueduct looks like it's wide open. What's the problem? He's got a cystic fluid collection subjacent to his foramen of Medendi, so he's probably obstructed at the outlet of the fourth. So he's not obstructed here, but he's obstructed down below. And that fits because of all these blood byproducts along the foramen of Lushka, probably the same thing along the foramen of Bajendi. Here's a child that was, uh, is uh, <clears throat> found to have an in utero stroke on fetal, um, fetal MRI at 20, uh, 29 weeks, hemorrhagic infarct more specifically. So I gave you a couple different studies. This was done at 39 weeks. This was the follow-up study at 32 months. Let's try and figure out what's going on here. So at 39 weeks, do we think it looks about, myelination looks about right for a, for a term infant? Probably, right? On the T2 and T1 weighted images. The ventricles don't look normal. They're way, way, far too large, right? But the temporal horns look pretty good, don't they? So maybe it's not hydrocephalus. Maybe there's some central white matter volume loss to account for this. Is it just central white matter volume losses or something else going on? Well, I told you there was a hemorrhagic infarct, but I didn't tell you where. Look at that left. Uh, here's the right caudate head. There's the putamen, the globus pallidus. There's just a big hole where that, where that uh, corpus striatum should be on the left. So that was probably the site of his, of his prior infarct. We see hemorrhage uh, in that immediate region extended into the ventricles. Um, and you can see here that... Uh, on the 
preliminary and the follow-up study that there's tremendous uh, loss of central white matter. Um, so the cort cortex looks okay, but there's no underlying white matter in that paracentral distribution, right? Here we can see some well area degeneration in the, in the brainstem, lo br volume loss in, the, in each thalamus as a result of this, this uh, insult compromising the projecting white matter tracts not to mention compromise of that left uh, corpus striatum. Okay, a child with hypoglycemia. So this is gonna make, take, uh, give you a little bit different uh, scenario. So this child was born at 37 weeks, well until 48 hours, but developed hypoglycemia and seizures um, shortly after birth. Um, placenta was said to have a high grade fetal vascular malperfusion. So what do we see in the T2 weighted images? Okay, I told you it's 37 weeks. Cortical organization, you know, cortical uh, sulcation pattern looks ab about right. But what's, what don't we see? Remember on the, on the earlier images I showed you, it was nice, strong contrast between the cortex and the white matter, right? Qu gray matter was gray, white matter was white. Easy to see. And the CSF space was relatively prominent. Contrast to that to what we see here. So do you see the gray-white delineation over here? No, right, that's disappearing. Same thing over here, albeit to a lesser degree. And the, cell, the CSF space looks a little bit effaced in contrast to what we'd expect at 37 weeks. So here's the diffusion study. Here's, a, here's the diffusion weight images, the ADC maps. What do we see? We see restricted diffusion along the medial and lateral margins of the, on the right on the medial margin on the left. Hypo intensity and ADC maps in the same distribution. What's the problem here? It doesn't look like a normal vascular territory, right? We're crossing vascular territories. You've got the PCA and the MCA. Something else, so it's not, it's not acute ischemia. It's probably acute cytotoxic edema from his prolonged hypoglycemia. So I showed you the MRA um, just to show you you know, if we're thinking acute ischemia, those PCAs look pretty darn good, don't they? They look really symmetric. They look wide open. The other reason for showing you this is that's the normal appearance of a newborn MRA. The vessels look small. They look attenuated. Um, so it doesn't look like the, like the older children. It doesn't look like an adult. That's the normal. Kind of ingrain that in your mind. That's what it's supposed to be. I also showed you this because at, pe at the time of the reading, people were concerned about this thing. Um, is that some sinus dural, dural sinus thrombosis, or is it normal? So I showed you one slice. I couldn't show all the oh, show you all the slices, but if you work your way through, there's flow-related enhancement right through that, and that's just the site of the molding. So it's you know the overlapping bones are just pressing on that superior sagittal sinus. It makes it look like it's like there's something in it, but it's not real. So. Watch out. In any event, so I, what I showed you is individual slices. Why? Because that's what I want you to look at. Okay. Um, neonatal seizures. 37 week um, preemie, preeclampsia, spontaneous vaginal delivery, APGARs of 8 and 9. Um, had uh, subgaleo and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and echogenic periventricular white matter on the, on the ultrasound. Seizures at day two. Um, EEG showed a focal central vertex um, epicenter um, for the seizures and moderate neonatal encephalopathy. So what do we see? I've got CT, I've got MR, T2s, diffusion weighted imaging. So here's our subgaleo fluid collections. Here is some subarachnoid blood in the interhemispheric fissure. So now you have to change, t change gears, right? We're looking at the CT. This bright stuff shouldn't be there, so that's some more subarachnoid blood, right? Sitting in the, uh, in the interhemispheric fissure. There it is on the, on the SWI, prominently hypo-intense, so you can compare CT and the SWI. <clears throat> what do we see on the, on the T2 weighted images? Is this somewhat reminiscent to what we saw a moment ago? Remember that gray-white delineation that we talked that we saw before on the, on the normal kids? What do we see here? 
Where's my gray white delineation? It's disappearing. So I'm using the inherent contrast, gray matter versus white matter, and I realize that it's gone medially and laterally over the temporal convexity. And if you go up superiorly, it looks like there's some paracentral involvement too. Look at our diffusion weighted imaging and the ADC maps. Striking extensive um, paracentral restricted diffusion, hyperintensity on in the, in the diffusion weighted images, hypointensity in the ADC maps. Look at the extensive involvement of the occipital poles. You can see more of the same um, as you, you know, look superiorly. So no matter where you look, you see this global event. So this is a child who has a, had a global hypo, um, event, or extensive cerebral uh, edema as, as a result of, uh, you know, so is this extensive cerebral edema from seizures? Or is it a, you know, global hypoxic event? You know, what's going on? So you can get certain, recognize that prolonged seizures are going to give you acute cytotoxic edema as well. So then I turn it back to you and what, you know, what, what transpired, you know, during, during, the, during the clinical course. Um, it's a little bit odd distribution for a global hypoxic event, isn't it? It's like Asgard's were normal. Maybe it was What's that? It's like the Asgard's were normal. Correct. It's like the normal Correct. And the, you know, I'll, I'll reinforce that just by imaging criteria. I look at the deep gray matter structures, they look pretty darn normal, don't they? And I know that, you know, if we think that he's had some postnatal, you know, global postnatal event, well, <clears throat> he's kind of at that transition between, you know, is, is he, so a global event in a preterm infant is going to re cause relative sparing of the pre and post central or the paracentral region. Um, in a full-term full -term child, there's going to be preferential involvement of that pre- and post-central gyri. This is kind of a, an odd distribution, isn't it? So it makes you think this, this is cytotoxic edema from prolonged seizures rather than a global hypoxic event, if I were to put it together. Um, what about uh, blood trauma? You have hypoxic ischemic So trauma. blunt trauma? Correct. So it so it could be could be trauma as well. Um, if um, I mean, you certainly got a lot of subgalia fluid high over the convexity, not so much dorsally. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the call, nanny. What do you <laughs> what, what do you see? You know, what happens? To the, so it's it's kind of putting putting pieces and parts together. You know, between between you and us, and, and coming up with a with you know conclusion as to what what transpired. But I agree. Yes, could it be trauma? Absolutely, particularly with the, with, uh, the subgaleal hemorrhages and the size of those things. Here's an here's a I included a, We just talked about these global events. Here's the chronic sequelae of a global uh, a, a event uh, at, at term in a term child. If you take a look, these are flare images. The flare images, you know, outside of the pre and post central gyri look pretty darn good, but everything paracentral looks severely compromised, right? We've got volume loss, we've got abnormal hyperintensity, and it projects caudally uh, in, along the corticospinal tracts and the thalamus and the uh, dorsal left lentif dorsal lentiform nuclei. Very symmetric appearance. You see some deep, gray, some other deep gray matter involvement. So this is the this is the long term sequelae of an event that probably happened perinatally in a full-term child. This is more periventricular leukomalacia. You see that same undulating appearance, the penimal surface abutting the overlying cortex. Um, you, get, you get an idea that, the, that there's central white matter volume loss because that corpus callosum is severely attenuated. And then you can try and characterize the, the underlying white matter. Does it make sense for um, this is a child who's eight months of age. Well, at eight months of age, the corpus callosum should be mature. It is. Internal capsule doesn't quite look mature, but there's not much white matter projecting down through it. Um, so maybe it's a little bit delayed, but seven months of age, we should see some hypointensity, and we don't see that on the T2 weighted images. Kind of difficult because we're, we're not seeing a lot of the parenchyma. You want to make a judgment on myelination based on, you know, a combination of findings. <clears throat>
Uh, just to kind of give you some other pathology that you might see. There's a child with an aqueductal web. What do we see? Striking upward bowing of the, cor of the corpus callosum. The lateral ventricle is markedly enlarged. The third ventricle is compressed. Why? Because the big lateral ventricles win over the, the small third ventricle. Fourth ventricle looks more normal, but not quite normal. And if you take a look at the KISS sequence, again, we reformatted it. So the aqueduct looks like it's distended up above, but tethered down below. And look at the size of that aqueduct at that caudal margin. So it's relatively small, so there's an aqueductal web causing relative obstruction. Here's the CSF flow study. So we don't see an awful, we see a little bit of flow, maybe, <laughs> but not much. We can see more obvious flow in the fourth ventricle, so the frame of Magendi is open, but we don't see much in that aqueduct, do we? Why? Because he's causing got relative obstruction. Well, I guess I should remind you. So these CSF flow studies are set up such that static tissue is gray, and then down motion down is white, motion back up is black. When it gets really rapid, we get this salt and pepper-like appearance, um, or this this uh, uh, probably best appreciated over here. That's it's far more rapid than, than, the, than the sequence will permit. In any event, you can see bidirectional flow in the prepontine premedullary cistern, ventral and dorsal to the, to the cerve upper cervical spinal cord. The brain stem's not moving, the cerebellum's not moving, the rest of the brain parenchyma is not moving. There's not much in, in, of any movement in the third ventricle or the lateral ventricles, so hence the obstruction at the level of the aqueduct. right? Usually it's the reverse. You see more flow up here than you do down here, but there's a lot of flow in the fourth and the outlet, but nothing up above. There's a child with congenital hydrocephalus. Again, prominent upward bowing of the corpus callosum, enlarged lateral and third ventricles. Here are the fourth ventricles also enlarged. Here's our friend, the KISS sequence. There the whole thing is, is distended, isn't it? Here's our CSF flow study. Here's a good example of our hyperdynamic flow. See the... the, the Instead of white or black, we see this something in between, right? That's aliasing, um, as you might see on ultrasound, because the flow is so rapid through that aqueduct. So we've got a foramen of Monroe are widely open, the third ventricle is wide open, the fourth ventricle is wide open, the foramen of Bedendi is wide open. This is communicating hydrocephalus. That's, that's my, the last of my, of my examples, if you will. So, you know, remember, you know, some lessons, some departing lessons on neonatal, neonatal MR. Remember, it's a moving target. The signal, you know, there are, you have to apply a variety of pulse sequences. Remember that the, that the normal is always varying over time during those first couple of years, particularly in the first few months of life. So you have to remember what's normal so you can figure out what's abnormal. Remember, you utilize T1s for myelination, for mass effect, to, to characterize the anatomy or localize the anatomy. T2s are sensitivity to disease. You use a combination of T1 and T2 to figure out myelination. Are, are they following the normal myelination milestones? Are they behind? Gradient echo images, or SWI, are particularly sensitive for, for picking up hemorrhage, but can also pick up calcification, air, um, more obviously hemorrhage. Gadolinium, again, we only use in setting of suspected you know, infection, acute inflammatory process, demyelination, you know, underlying neoplasms. Um, and then we've got some specialized sequences for, for certain indications. Remember the HACE sequence that we introduced during the first lecture, which is a kind of quick, dirty uh, evaluation for hydrocephalus or not, instead of in lieu of sending the child for a follow-up head CT, avoid the radiation. The KISS sequence, as we saw before, to characterize to, to, for a high-resolution study, figure out, is he obstructed the aqueduct? Are, they, are there internal septations? Is he obstructed the outlet of the fourth? What's going on? Um, and then the CSF flow study to help you figure out in those children that you think are obstructed. If so, where um, and how severe? Thanks very much for your attention. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.